Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a real delight to be here. I'm going to shamelessly promote my own book. <laughs> it's an anthology of poems uh, about death and dying, and I thought it would be good to start with, with one that was written by uh, a family member. He's never published any poetry in his life, but I thought it was appropriate for this. I miss the arms that held me tight. I miss uh, the kiss that set my heart aflame, the smile that filled my life with light, the tender way you spoke my name, the way we wandered hand in hand, building castles in the air, not caring if the things we planned made sense, as long as you were there. I miss the joy of love we know, the passion stirred by your caress. You were my rock, constant, true. You were my total happiness. And I think what happens uh, when people are caring for somebody that they love who is dying, uh, a whole lot of things that, that have been in the past don't seem quite right. And uh, we'll talk about those uh, in a little while. Um, <clears throat> palliative care has been remiss in, in including people with MND uh, enough, in my view. Uh, Cicely Saunders, who founded the, the modern hospice movement in the 1960s, did actually have a ward at St Christopher's Hospice for people with neurodegenerative diseases. But a lot of times we don't, we don't get to know these uh, people and their families often enough. International consensus suggests that a multidisciplinary approach using all of you in, in the palliative care team would be beneficial. The, the, the trouble is that uh, referrers are still um, thinking that palliative care is about terminal care. And uh, palliative care is not about terminal care. Palliative care is about making the most of life and, and helping people to live well until the end of life. It's also about supporting the family to be able to live well and adjust to the changes that are happening. There's also as, as Steve has pointed out, if you go to a, um, an ALS clinic or a palliative care ALS clinic, there's significant evidence that palliative care intervention improves quality of life and possibly quantity. So what are the triggers for referral to palliative care? Well, uh, the consensus is that um, if you've got respiratory symptoms, clinical signs or symptoms of respiratory insufficiency, or weakness re requiring um, NIPPV, or nutritional decline uh, requiring enteral feeding, or severe pain or psychological distress, or rapidly progressive par paralysis in two body regions. So if you think about the people that you're caring for now, I would imagine that a significant number of them might qualify for referral to palliative care service. What I'm going to do just now is... Oh, I'll let you watch this. On a warm autumn afternoon, Roseanne Ten Hoonan has a job that needs doing. There's a cupboard full of clothes she wants to sort out. So it's dark here, yeah? A task Roseanne is keen to oversee before she dies. Roseanne is a remarkable lady. When I first arrived, it wasn't what I was expecting. She was up and about. Um, she was very mobile. Loads of family. In April 2012, Roseanne was diagnosed with multiple myeloma a cancer of the plasma cells in her bone marrow. <coughs> and then, on May 7, Roseanne's oncologist delivered the worst possible news. He said, can't do nothing anymore now. Everything was failing. So he had a <coughs> family meeting with us to tell us that time I was still at Newton. And he had a family meeting and he said we had an option whether be in the hospital or be at home, because we could tell it there. And they did it good. And I said, no, I'm not at home. We were given an option, um, but I reckon it was really good because mum's idea 
to have family around her and to, you know, to die at home with a supportive palliative care because this is the last days for her and, you know, as long as she's comfortable and she goes in peace, do what we want. And that's her wish. What was going through your head about making that decision? Oh my God, I don't believe you. don't have to think at the time because the news wasn't good, you know. So I didn't have to think, I just thought to myself, oh well, if I gotta go, well, I, I have to go. I can't do anything now. And then that's when I decided, no, I'm going with palliative care, I'll be more happy. Palliative care. So Roseanne, uh, as was pointed out, is a remarkable woman. Um, I, I show that film to try to illustrate a program which we've uh, been able to set up in half of New South Wales, trying to address the gaps that enable people to be cared for in the place of their choosing. Over 70% of Australians want to die at home. Uh, between 16 and 18% succeed. I don't know why that is. Well, I do know why it is. And, and uh, one of the reasons that we've uh, developed this program is to try to uh, enable people to stay at home. So in seeking to address the gap um, which, uh, which supports people to do this at home and their family, what we've done is to provide uh, palliative care home so support packages and there are some leaflets about that package out on the desk outside. So if you think that you're caring for somebody who is uh, facing the end of life, then I think it would be good to alert your colleagues to the potential for this uh, program to be um, introduced. So what it is, is we provide 48 hours of end of life care. So that's not all in one lump. It can be 48 days of an hour a day or however you want it. And that's provided through care workers who have specialized palliative care training. And with a link with the palliative care team, you get oversight and case management. In addition, what we've done is to create a statewide education program. And uh, a little bit later on, I'll introduce you to the Palliative Care Bridge. Those of you that have seen the handbook uh, will recognize that it's meant to be a generic palliative care advisory uh, document. It's, it's written in simple terms. It's in bullet points. And we've um, given away, I think, 10,000 copies in New Zealand. And we've given away about 3,000 copies here. I've given away 10 this morning. <laughs> But there are some more. We're just in the process of, of um, revising and updating it. So what we're trying to do is to, is to provide education to generalists, people who aren't say, thinking of themselves as specialist palliative care providers. And we're doing an evaluation of it. So in order to try to improve the care of people who are dying near the end of their life, we, we need to find out, well, what, where do we start? Well, we start with the patient and, and the family. What, what is it that they want to do? And in your caring for people, you need to have the conversation about where they want to end their days. Um, in order for them to die at home, then the whole of the multidisciplinary team needs to be enrolled so that um, all the needs can be met. The, the patient and the family need to retain choice and they need to retain control. Having choice and control doesn't happen in acute hospitals. It doesn't often happen in residential facilities, although this program can be instituted into a nursing home. My experience of working uh, with families where somebody has a motor neurone disease is that a whole raft of professionals uh, grow around them and support them. And communication and linking and enabling is, is a key to helping people to get what they want. The support needs to be flexible and we need to be able to be sure that the, the professionals that are needed come and go, not when the professional thinks, but it's perhaps when the family thinks that they need them, doing what the family want and need. 
And, and so the end of life care is shaped by the patient. Now currently we've looked after about 450 people on this program and the home death rate is 78%. Um, so I think in a lot of ways we're succeeding. Now it may well be that the, there is a, a selection process going on by the primary health care team or the palliative care team. But that, that's not evident from the people that we've been caring for. So what do you do when you're managing somebody who, whose condition is declining? Deterioration is often accompanied by an increase in anxiety. What's happening to me? I'm dying. And a, de a de decrease in function. I, I'm not able to look after the things that I was able to look after. But what is it that this deterioration is, is in? Is it physical deterioration? It's really easy, isn't it, to, to identify physical deterioration. It might be easy to identify psychological deterioration, but in order to do that, you've got to spend a long time listening. Is it to do with social deterioration? Are they feeling very often people with, with motor neuron disease, because they have a disease which people feel uncomfortable with, have what's called a, a social death, in the same way that people with dementia have a social death before they have a physical death. Or what is going on in their spiritual world? What is their, how is their framework supporting them? Are they thinking, why is this happening to me? Why is it happening now? What did I do wrong? What was the purpose of life? Has God abandoned me? All of those questions that I don't see being addressed in the motor neuron disease literature. Maybe they are, and I'm just looking in the wrong place. But I would imagine that the majority of people with motor neuron disease and their families will experience a significant degree of spiritual distress or disquiet. So when you're managing dying, the focus obviously is on comfort. But in order to find out what that means, you have to listen to the patient and the family. Comfort may not mean lying in a bed with your arms crossed, peacefully waiting to die. It may mean sitting out in the garden, uh, smelling the roses. People who are dying have a lot of medications. They just seem to accumulate them over the, over the weeks before the end of their life. You can throw the vast majority of them away. It's a trial. Anybody ever tried taking a whole course of antibiotics for one week? I bet you're not very good at it. Taking one pill three or four times a day for a week is a challenge. Take the average pe number that I uh, see people taking is nine or ten medications. Some twice a day, some three times a day, some four times a day. Limit those. Or, or change the route of administration to make it easier for them to get them and anticipate symptoms and, and in the handbook we identify all the symptoms that people who are dying might experience and you know those well enough. So how do you know when somebody's dying? Well, when I first started working in hospice in England I was curious as to know uh, how people knew when somebody was dying. And so there were 14 nurses on the unit that I was a small six-bedded unit in the southwest of England, and I asked them, how do you know when somebody's dying? And there were answers like, well, you know, the breathing changes or the periphery gets cold, or then they began to be a bit more specific. Oh, there was a change in color around the mouth, the nose changed shape. So there were a lot of different uh, examples given, how, how people know when somebody's dying. Two nurses gave the same reply. And they both said, a black crow comes and sits outside the window. <laughs> and I've told this story all over the world, and usually there's a sort of murmur of amusement. But after I spoke uh, in, in one country about that story, somebody came up to me at the end and, and, and said, don't mock the black crow, that's a messenger from the gods. And in a lot of cultures, in, in Maori culture, it's a fantail that comes. Or, a, or an owl, but I think there are things that people look for to know whether somebody's approaching the end of life. But you know, on the slide there are physical changes. People get increasingly weak and sleepy. When people say to you, 
how do you think I'm going to die, doctor? Probably the worst thing that you can say is, well, you'll probably die in your sleep. Because what happens then is that people <laughs> stay rigid and awake. And I've seen people sitting up on the edge of the bed, their knuckles white holding the edge of the mattress. I think people do need to understand how they're going to die because very often what, they've, what their experience of death is, comes from the television or the movies where, where things are unpleasant and things... Um, Stuff comes out, doesn't it? Or, or people are really distressed. The reality is most people's dying is gentle. And those of you that sit with people who are dying will know that it is, more often than not, a gentle process. I teach the medical students that when they, when they go to watch somebody uh, giving birth, Everybody knows what's going to happen when somebody's giving birth, when a woman's giving birth. There's a lot of noise and pushing and, and labour. But as soon as the baby comes out, there is a split second when everybody goes, as a sharp intake of breath, as if, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> there is that moment of almost magic. And those of you that sit with people at the end of life will know quite often that there is also, at the end of life, similarly, oh, they've gone. There's a little intake of breath as, as life ends. And suddenly there is a realisation, gosh, they've gone. It's a, it's a similar ah moment. There can be twitching and moaning. Uh, dying isn't quite... The, the sort of Victorian deathbed scene of everybody sitting around and everybody being quiet, it can be noisy. So in your role, it's important that planning for death happens. It, it shouldn't come as a surprise. If they're in an institution, you need to make sure that advanced care plans are in place so that they don't get bundled off into an ambulance going to the ED department because they've got a bit of a respiratory infection. You need to understand what their cultural or religious wishes are because you might make assumptions because you look at me and you see a white fellow who's got a Scottish name and think, well, you know, he's got a Scottish heritage. I think I probably know what he wants. You need to ask what those people want and need. And a lot of people who are facing the end of life are very frightened. And the fear is predominantly because they don't know what's going to happen. You do know what's going to happen because you've worked with situations like this for months or years or decades in some situations. So you are able to reassure people that you know what's going to happen and you can help them to prepare and to reduce the anxiety. The almost hysterical uh, um, responses, particularly on social media, of the demands for euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide are driven by fear. They're driven by fear of having an agonizing, undignified death. They're driven by fear of not being in control. The whole of this program and the whole of the focus of your end-of-life care is to take away the fear, to take away the pain, the distress. You can't take away all the suffering, but you can reduce it. And you can do as much as you possibly can to ensure that those patients and families are in control all the time. So managing anxiety is very important. Anticipate what's going to happen. Don't wait for a crisis and then family to ring you up and say, I don't know what to do now, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning. You can prescribe analgesics and antiemetics and anxiolytics and anti-secretory drugs. Most of these are going to be given through the subcutaneous route. And you can teach families to do that. Now, this is the palliative care handbook. Uh, it's available from Hammond Press, so if you go onto the um, Hammond Care website and go to Hammond Press, um, 
it'll tell you how to get it. You can also buy it from Amazon or iTunes as, as an e-book. We're, we're thinking of, um, well, we're going to try and make an app for it as well, because I think it might be easier for most people to use an app. <laughs> Although a lot of GPs particularly like to have the handbook, it's, it, those of you that have got it will know it's just a little, um, that's it. It was originally designed, this is how old I am, it was designed that size to fit into a white coat pocket. <laughs> <laughs> We've been writing it for um, 26 years now and it's, it's evolved and adapted. And, the other thing that I would ask of you is if there are elements in there, or if there are elements that you think that should be in that book and aren't, email me and tell me, because we're, we're constantly updating it and, and adapting it. Most times what you're going to be doing is, is working with the carers. And the carers, we talk about this thing about a carer burden, the burden of care. Now, I don't know where that phrase came from because a, a society, most families actually want to care for each other, that's, part, that's why we're in a family. So it isn't necessarily a burden but sometimes it can become very wearing. And the ones who, who exhibit the most uh, um, distress are those in which the burden seems to be coming intolerable. And the risks are that you're a woman, that you've got low educational attainment, uh, that you live with the care recipient, you spend a lot of hours providing care for that recipient, you might have developed a depressive illness, you're socially isolated, there's financial distress or stress, and a lack of choice about being a caregiver. I mean, these may sound self-evident, but I think trying to identify the, the, what the families are going through and alleviating some of this is, is part of what your job is. There's a different thing which is called carer strain. And carer strain happens when you have your sleep disturbed frequently. Those of you that have had children will, will know that the strain of caring for children, I was going to say little children, but actually it doesn't get any bigger <laughs> and they get bigger. Being confined at home, uh, having adjustments to the family, changing your personal plans, not being able to do the things that you'd hoped for, having increased demands on your time, emotionally adjusting, like the man in the poem, um, dealing with changed behaviours and adjusting financially. I mean, in, in most countries in the world, being sick is very expensive. So we talked a little bit about hope, and I've been interested in hope for, for a long time. Since my time in, in uh, Wellington, when I first arrived in New Zealand, I was interested in, in people's health professionals' perceptions of hope. So we did a comparative study looking at hope in people with MND and hope with people in MS. The physicians looking after people with MND were the most hopeless, or the ones who had the least hope. So what is hope? It's not desire or optimism, it's not merely expectation, although some of those emotions do play a part. It's to entertain the expectation of something desired, it's to have a well-founded expectation, but in order to have that expectation, those things have got to be real. So you have to know what you can hope for. Um, I, I love this. We ridicule those who have too much of it. We hospitalize those who have too little of it. It is dependent on so many things, yet indisputably necessary to most. Those who have it live longer. Words can't destroy it. I would, I would disagree with that. Science has overlooked it. A day without it is dreadful. A day with an abundance of it guarantees little. So part of what you, in your role, need to do is to help to cultivate realistic hope. Not hope for a cure or hope that 
everything will suddenly be okay. Most of my life is spent dealing with people with uh, metastatic malignant disease. And oftentimes when they come to see me, they have the perception that there is no hope. And I well remember the, the brightest example of hope that I teach about is a woman, I used to have to go and consult in a, a hospital called the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases. This was in Bath in southwest England, and this was a quaternary referral centre. So people from all over the country came with destructive arthritis and I, my heart sank whenever I had to go and see anybody there because these had been through a lot of specialists. And I was seeing a lady who actually couldn't move without significant pain. She had such bad joint disease. It was, you could hear it crunching, it was awful. And I said to her, uh, what, what gives you hope? And on her uh, bed table was a rose. And she looked at that and smiled and said, look at that. That's just so beautiful. And then her face lit up. She was looking, uh, not at me, but uh, over my shoulder. And her granddaughter had come in to the ward and she said, there you are. That's what I hope for. And so hope can be hope for a night's sleep. It can be hope for um, relief of pain, it can be hope to be held by the person you love most. My colleague Wendy Duggleby from um, Alberta looked at hope in non-terminally ill people and terminally ill people, so the, the ones that I'm concerned with that are on the right, so living day to day, they hope that they can see some joy in each day, they hope that they might feel better than they did at the end of the previous day, they hope for relief of pain and not suffering more. Suffering is a whole other talk that we might have in two years' time. Hoping for a peaceful death. A lot of people hope for life after death and they hope for their families. If you're not dying, the things that you might hope for if you've got an illness is that you get cured or get better or have your pain relieved or live longer. So in order to develop hope, you have to have a realistic assessment of the predicament or threat. And so if you've been to, let's use the example of the, the few doctors who would say, well, you might die within a year with motor neurone disease, is that a realistic predicament or threat? Well, probably it isn't. So you can provide hope by giving them an assessment of what is realistic. Envisioning alternatives and setting goals. So you're good at setting goals, aren't you? That's part of what your job is. You brace for negative outcomes. You know it's not going to be a bed of roses, but in order to brace for those negative outcomes, you need to help people to understand what they're going to be. This may happen, and this is how we're going to help you. A realistic assessment of personal and, and external resources. What are your resources? For example, what, what is the framework that gives your life meaning? You can talk to people about their spiritual framework, they might not understand what you're saying, but if you ask them a question, what gives your life meaning? For those people with a faith, they'll say, God, or my faith, but most Australians don't have a faith, and if you ask them, they might say, my family, or they might say, the blues winning the state of origin. I don't know. People have a lot of different things that give their life meaning. Trying to be sure that we have mutually supportive relationships is, is really important for the maintenance of hope. And the determination to persevere. Steve talked about that, that, that hopefulness that you will live a good day today and you will live another good day tomorrow. Persevering, getting through this, battling on. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with the idea of battling disease, but Certainly overcoming disease is what I, what I hope people can do. You may even want to use this thing called the Hearth Hope Index. Kathy Hearth was a nurse who developed this and she's written a lot about this. And it's a very good way of identifying how, how hopeful people are. Do you have a meaningful relationship? 
do you have the ability to feel light-hearted? 25 years ago, I was involved with something called the WHOQUAL, the World Health Organization Quality of Life Tool, and it was designed, or we were designing it, I was only a little tiny bit player, to be used anywhere in the world, in any situation. So it didn't matter if you were sick or well, black or white, hot or cold, rich or poor. What are the things that give people quality of life? And you might think, well, food in your tummy, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, some money in your pocket. No, those come lower down. Two of the top rated things were the presence of a meaningful relationship and the ability to feel light-hearted. That's why we manage symptoms. You can't feel light-hearted if you've got your head in a bucket being sick. You can't feel light-hearted if you're drooling all of the time or you've got pain. If you take away the symptoms or minimize them, then you can have a laugh. I can remember going to see somebody who was a young man. He was a Marine. He'd been in the Royal Marines, a very big, strong man in his 30s, developed motor neuron disease, very rapidly progressive. And for some reason, I can't remember why, he spent a lot of time on a tilt table. And the, the conversation was really, it was quite heavy because they were a young couple, they had a little baby, and the whole thing seemed ghastly. And I asked them about their sexual relationship. I, I, I made an assumption and I said, this must have affected your relationship. And they both started giggling. And I said, well, what's so funny? And the wife said, we have never had so much fun as since we had that tilt table. <laughs> <laughs> Finding something, a point, a point of humor, is, is clearly important. In order to have hope, you need to have personal attributes of determination and courage and serenity. I think we've all got those. Some, some people display it more than others. You've got to have clear aims. You have to understand what it is you're hoping for. You might be hoping that the Australian rugby team will win the Rugby World Cup. That's not realistic. <laughs> but you can think, I know the All Blacks are going to win. That's a realistic hope. You have to really understand what your spiritual beliefs are. That isn't to say you have to understand what your religion is, because people with religion do understand that. But what is it that you believe you're here for? What's your role in life? What's your purpose? The ability to recall positive moments helps to maintain hope. And a lot of palliative care services will have a biography service in order to help people to understand, yes, there were really good times. I did achieve things. Having one's individually accepted and respected, it's difficult in a hospital, but it's much more easy at home. So how do you foster hope? Well, here are some of the things. Facilitate caring relationships, humor and play, determination and courage, all the things that are in Kathy Hearth's index. Down at the bottom, pain and symptom management and listening attentively, not sitting there on your iPad or whatever it is, but listening with, with the whole of you. Things that decrease hope are feeling devalued as a person, feeling abandoned and isolated, having a lack of direction and having uncontrolled symptoms. And tip that on its head, feeling valued as a person, meaningful relationships, realistic goals. Those are the things. This is uh, Wendy Duggleby's work. So enhancing hope. I'm not sure what hope rituals are, but sharing stories of hope. Making something happen. These are things that you can do. Using pictures or symbols of hope. A lot of people will use uh, symbols of hope. I don't know what they are, but you can find out. And having humour. Now, when all of this is over, one of the things that's important to do is to think, well, how, how did we get on? When the person the, has died and the family are 
grieving or being relieved sometimes, um, it might be good as a team to think, well, what, did, what went well? Because a lot of times we just move on to the next one. And having an after-death review, I think, is really important. Did the patient and family resolve any, any, any unfinished business? Were opportunities to say goodbye? There are four things that people need to do in order to die well. Do you know what they are? The first is to have an opportunity to say thank you. The second is to say, please forgive me. The third is to say, I forgive you. And the fourth is to say, I love you. And if you have the opportunity to do, do those things and you can facilitate that, then chances are people will feel complete and can let go. The difficult thing, uh, the hardest thing, is to say, I love you, to yourself. To be able to nod to yourself and say, yep, you did OK. It's been a really interesting experience in the last couple of weeks since I got this order of merit thing. Because people have been constantly telling me, yep, you did OK. And it's very hard for a Presbyterian boy to think, yep, I can just imagine my mother <laughs> saying, no, no, <laughs> don't get above yourself. <laughs> Was death peaceful and dignified? Was everything possible to done, done to care for the patient and the family? How could it have been improved? And what have we learned that we carry to the next family? Because the way that I practice is that I collect stories. Lord Tennyson said, we are but a collection of memories. And what you do is you build up your uh, filing cabinet full of families where somebody has motor neurone disease, is you, you fill up that filing cabinet with stories. What are you going to take to the next family? And the one after that, and the one after that. Now, oh. Now, I'm just going to show you a three or four minute clip about the palliative care bridge so that you will understand what the palliative care bridge is. Hello, I'm Lee Hatcher, Hammond Cares Director of Public Affairs. Welcome to the palliative care bridge. The videos on this site, together with a wealth of other information here, seeks to create a bridge of knowledge for health professionals to better help people who want to die at home, to support living right to the very end. Here's our senior staff specialist, Professor Ron McLeod, on the difference that he hopes the palliative care bridge can make. Well, I hope it's going to give people confidence. A lot of times people will, um, when they're faced with somebody who's dying, they'll think, oh, God, And they'll think, oh, that's a specialist service now. Can I do it myself? And the answer, 95% of the time, is yes, you can do it yourself. Sometimes you just need reassurance. I always remember when I was a, a family doctor in rural uh, Norfolk, we used to refer our patients to a very grand physician who trained at one of the London teaching hospitals. And he after he'd seen the patient and, and made his diagnosis and so forth, he would always say to the patient, I think your doctor's doing a fantastic job. There's one or two things I'd suggest to him. <coughs> and in some senses, I think that's a rough reason to life. Because we know that people are doing a fantastic job. And here are just one or two things that we'd like to suggest. You can take them or leave them. But at least they're there. And they will give you confidence and hopefully increase your competence to provide the best care possible and help people to live right up until the end of their life. From your vast experience in this particular area, what do you think health professionals have typically thought about having care? Well, I think when, we, when, when I started, it was something which 
every GP sees, but they didn't necessarily do it terribly well. Then it became a specialty, and I think people shied away from it at all. You know, as, as, as specialists do this now, we just hand it over. What most families want is they want somebody who's trusted and who they feel safe with. So rather than the specialist coming in and saying, stand aside, I, I can do this, what, what we want to do is to give people a chance to, to remain with their trusted colleague, their trusted profession. So when I stand back, what I see is, is a health workforce which feels confident and capable to deliver care for people ultimately in the bed that they want to die in. So if they want to die at home, then the resources are available to them. Because many more people are and will be seeking to exercise that choice. And here in New South Wales, currently we have a program running which enables people to, to die at home by the provision of healthcare workers who also, interestingly, get a copy of the palliative care handbook so that they've got the confidence that they at least know what we're talking about when we're, when we're managing the symptoms. The GPs have all got a hard copy of the handbook, but this is just going to build on that and, and help them to, uh, to feel good about what it is. Um, so that's the website. For those of you that don't want to write it down, there are free fridge magnets outside on the... <laughs> so I'm just going to finish with, a, with another poem written by Balfour Mount, who's the man, the Canadian surgeon who coined the term palliative care. A great man. It's, called, uh, it's from a book called Finding Meaning. Let me find meaning, Lord, when faced with finality caught in the crucible is when we are down and experiencing a time of adversity that we may be most able to open the doors of our personalities and expose our needs. No time for pretense. Masks stripped away. In the hard light of finality, so much that was treasured fades away. Things, events, in the perspective of this light, they are but dust. Instead, time, feelings, relationships, to relate to others, to give, and in doing so, to receive, to become empty by opening, so that we may be filled, to recognize that only in dying we can find life, dying to ourselves, that we may be open to the other. Thank you I very just much. want to say that on the palliative care bridge there are 62 or 63 short videos about every aspect of end-of-life care including some of your gang looking at aspects of motor neuron disease and speech pathology and OT and physio. But again, if you go to the bridge and you flick through and you've watched all 62 videos and you think, I know, there's something here that's missing, please write and tell us because we want to build this resource for everybody, not just for um, people with cancer. It's meant to be right across the board.